Hello everybody. I hope everyone is having an amazing New Year's Eve and that the New Year brings you nothing but good things. For most people, New Year's is a time to start clean and fresh with a renewed hope of maybe good things to come and a desire to change things we don't like in ourselves or our habits. I find this to be ironic when coupled with the story I'm about to tell you. Here on Hillbilly Files, one of our goals is to keep history and people alive that once existed and may be forgotten or even misunderstood in ways. I want to revisit a tragic tale that happened on January 1st, 1888, when on a cold, dark night the McCoys' lives were changed yet again in a horrible way, and though they didn't know it at the time, so was the Hatfields. 134 years ago was the New Year's Day Massacre. Yes, 134 years ago. This occurred in Hardy, Kentucky at the home site of Randall and Sarah McCoy. Most of us that are interested in the feud or have studied about it or seen the series or movie know the story as it's been portrayed endless times and it has just become fact that it happened that way. But if you dig deeper, there's always more to every story and this is no different. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read a letter that I came across that was wrote and published in October of 1888. It's a confession of a young 19-year-old that was involved in the raid. His name was Charles Gillespie. He wrote this confession as he sat in prison. This is what happened that fateful night in Charles Gillespie's own words. Pittsburgh, October 16, 1888. Charles Gillespie. On the first day of last January I was at home when Cap Hatfield came along and said, Charlie, we are going over into Kentucky tonight to have some fun. Get a horse and meet us and go along. Well, I did not know what was up, but I told Cap, I would be on hand, after a little trouble I got a horse and was at the rendezvous, where I found Cap, John C., Ellis, Bob and Ellet Hatfield, old Jim Vance, Ellis and Mounts, and a man who goes by the name of both Mitchell and Chambers, whom I know by the name of Gorilla. Jim Vance was in command of the party, and it was agreed at the start, before the real object of the trip was disclosed, that all should yield to everything he said and to do all that he might order us to do. It has been claimed that the whole Hatfield neighborhood was with us that night. This is not true. There were just nine of us, and the nine I have mentioned. Arriving at a convenient distance from the McCoy house I was first made acquainted with the real object of our trip. Vance told us that if old Randall McCoy and his son Cal were out of the road, every material witness against the men who had taken part in the murder of the three McCoy boys would be removed, and there could be no conviction of any of them, even if they might at some time be arrested for it. All had become tired of dodging the officers of the law, and wished to be able to sleep at home beside better bedfellows than Winchester rifles, and to occasionally take off their boots when they went to bed. This was the reason that old Jim Vance gave us, and Cap and John's Hatfield agreed with him. Well, we determined if the family would not come out when we should warn them to, to shoot through the windows and door of the house from the ends and sides with our Winchesters, volley after volley, until all inside would be dead or disabled. The only reply the McCoys made to our demand to come out was to bar and barricade the doors and prepare to fight us till the last. We shot through the windows and doors, and our shooting was responded to by old Ranel and Cal, the former with a double-barreled shotgun and the other with a Winchester. We had to be very careful, as both were good shots. I must tell you right here that I was not one of those who were doing the shooting. Me and one of the other Hatfields was put out along the road to act as guards, to see that no one came up, or that no one got past us. We never went near the house until the house was burning, and all was on their way back to Hatfield's house. When they came up Ellis and Mounts said to me, well, we killed the boy and girl, and I am sorry of it. We have made a bad job of it. We didn't get the man we wanted at all, meaning old Ranel. If we had got him it would have been all right, and our work would not have been lost. There will be trouble over this. I asked him about the fight as we went along home, and he told me how Chambers had crawled upon the roof to get at those inside and to fire the house, when Randall heard him, and firing at him through the shingles, shot his hand off behind the knuckles. He said Chambers got down, tied his hurt hand, and, taking his Winchester, began shooting again. It took some time to get the McCoys out, but finally the door opened and Cal ran out at the top of his speed toward a corn crib. Several banged away at him, but none of the shots took effect, and one or two more shots were fired, 
when he was seen to jump up and fall forward. We went to him and found him dead, with a big hole in the back of his head. The girl came out of one of the two dwelling houses and wanted to get into the one where the family was, as some of the men told her to go back, but she knew them and named them, and she was killed. Cap was blamed for this, but I think Mounts did it. I could not find out who struck old Mrs. McCoy with the butt of the revolver, but I think Mounts did this, too. The hammer of the revolver penetrated her skull, and when she fell several of the men jumped upon her, breaking her ribs, and when they left her thought she was dead. I had let my horse go on the way to the house of the McCoys, and had to get up behind Mounts, better known as Cotton Top and Cotton Eye, because he has white hair and white eyes. On the way home he talked a great deal. Once he said, if John Hatfield had not shot before we were ready, there would not have been one of the McCoys in that house alive now. That shot gave them inside a correct idea of the location of some of the men, and they kept us well in sight right along thereafter. They kept us so far away that it was a long time before we got up to the house and unable to do anything. From Charleston Gillespie was taken to the house of Detective P. I. Campbell at Wellston, Ohio, where he told his story again to Mrs. Campbell, who wrote it out and had Gillespie swear to it before the mayor of Wellston. He was then committed to jail at Ironton, where he was visited by J. Lee Ferguson, prosecuting attorney of Pike County, Pa, and to him the story was retold. On last Saturday he was removed to Catlettsburg Jail, in the state of Kentucky, and on Monday taken to the jail at Pike County by James McCoy, son of Randall McCoy. I saw Captain Alf Burnett, chief of the Eureka Detective Agency, yesterday at Charleston, the capital of West Virginia. Where are the Hatfields? I asked Captain Burnett. All of the name, I think, are in Logan County. Some of those connected with the gang have left the country and are in hiding in various places, but I think the greater portion of the gang is in its old haunts. Cap is back from the Southwester, and Johns got back ten days ago from his wandering. Cap is the one especially wanted by the Kentucky authorities, and next to him Johns, the gorilla and old ants are also badly wanted and will eventually find their way into the Pike County Jail. Have you heard of John C. Trouble? continued Captain Burnett. Well, some time ago his wife tired of him and she left him and went over into Kentucky and took up with Frank Phillips, and has been living with him ever since in a cabin in the woods of Pike County. She is a McCoy by birth, but not a daughter of old Randall. She is a handsome, well-developed young woman, and says she will go no more to the Hatfields. What reward is there out for the Hatfields? Here is a curious and interesting condition of things. Within a radius of 20 miles are all of the people concerned in these murders. Kentucky has a standing offer of $1,200 for Cap Hatfield, $1,000 each for Ants and John C., $600 each for Ellet, Elias and Bob Hatfield and the Gorilla, while smaller rewards await the captors of some of the smaller fry. On the other hand, West Virginia offers $100 for each of 28 of the McCoy contingent and $500 for Frank Phillips, to which the Hatfields have added $600 more. Cotton Top would eventually hang for the death of Ali Fair McCoy and others would go to prison. This was the official end of the feud. Thank you for watching and for the support this year. We hope to do more in 2023.